Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a stats indoctrination system in audio and visual format. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I will be your instructor for these proceedings. Now on his seventh session at a desperate attempt to correct his ideas about division by zero, it's Bart. How's it going, Bart? Good. Um, I feel like maths re-education was not something I signed up for, but at the same time, the revolution requires sacrifice. I mean, you literally chose to be here. It's your own <laughs> fault. <laughs> This episode of more of a history lesson than anything technical, a nice break from our calculations to talk about um, the horrors of how statistics was developed for and used by eugenics. How delightful. We're going to look at the specific legacy of three of the founders of modern statistics, some of the statistical methods they built, and how their ideology influenced their work. This episode comes with the content warning for discussion of race, racism, genocide, and medical abuse and other violence against people with disabilities. I'll put references to sources in the notes below, some of this comes from Wikipedia pages, but there's also biographies and some soul-searching academic papers in the face of all of this shit. The first of our dark triad is Sir Francis Galton. How could a guy named like that be a monster? I know, right? He was English too. <laughs> Who is so central to the history of eugenics that he actually coined the term? He was also half-cousin to Charles Darwin, and so enamoured of Darwin's theory of evolution that he extended it to human societies under the logic that clearly everything comes from biology, so all hierarchies and social structure must be biological in origin. Of course, this meant that Galton, a white English tough, was clearly biologically superior because he had wealth, power, social position, and was reasonably bright. This is a running theme, white people born into privilege finding ways to prove that they are biologically superior to others. As a colossal fucking nerd, Galton took his habit for measuring and quantifying things and turned it to his ideological interests. He was really interested in whether human ability, whatever that means, was hereditary, and the ways that human populations varied from each other. Because this was genuinely early days of stats and sociology, there weren't a lot of instruments for measuring and comparing populations. You could go and take physical measurements of bodies, but Galton's notion of human ability went beyond that, and there weren't ways to rigorously compare data across populations. The comparisons mattered to Galton, because without them, how could he show that A, races were different, and B, his was better? Galton developed ways to measure a bunch of stuff like mental characteristics of quote-unquote ability, and his notions of intelligence more generally, and set about collecting data on that. Things like height, facial structure measurements, eugenicists do love their skull shapes, even the distributions of what he called eminent men in families were of interest to him, particularly to show if the propensity to become eminent could be inherited. One of this guy's most famous works is called Hereditary Genius, based on those observations. It is exactly the kind of self-serving, great men beget greatness you would expect from a self-determined genius English rich guy. Galton also had a genuinely quite funny theory about how genius was related to mental illness. Not funny because haha mental illness, but funny because it was entirely self-serving. <laughs> he came up with it after he dropped out of uni due to a bunch of basically emotional breakdowns. Being so assured of his own genius, he had to come up with an explanation for why he dropped out when his classmates continued. Please. Look, I, I can relate to that. I know, but like, I basically <laughs> everyone I know has had multiple breakdowns in uni. Some have even dropped out as a result. They just didn't have the luxury of going on to still investigate what they were interested in afterwards because they had to work for a living. Absolutely. Even in my most self-pitying moments during those breakdowns, I did not determine that I'm some sort of tortured genius whose torture is proportional to my genius, as Galton did. <laughs> I took it to be evidence that maybe I wasn't as bright as I thought, or at least that didn't look how I thought it looked. I would point out, um, with, with the connection to Darwin, that social Darwinism isn't as separable from Darwin as is often made out to be. Oh, no, because, absolutely like, not. <laughs> Darwin, like, um, cites Malthus, like, three or four times in um, in the Natural Selection book, etc. Like, Yeah, well, as soon as you start thinking about the notion of evolution and competition, as he did, he was thinking about it in terms of, like, who wins, who is, quote-unquote, more fit. And, like, when you extend that to 
human populations and social structure, you start looking at social hierarchies like they are evidence of superiority, which is slightly misguided and also kind of doesn't reflect the way that even biological evolution works. Like, everything that is alive at this point in time is equally evolved because it's still alive. Like, this idea of evolution as a progress sort of thing just doesn't work. It's chance-based, pretty much. And the tendency towards adaptation towards a particular uh, to a particular environment doesn't actually have any kind of moral like dimension to it. And I feel like um, people on the left can fall in, into that trap oh, as well. Yeah. Like Kropotkin spends a lot of time writing about like uh, cooperation in animals as if that it was like a kind of like um, higher. Yeah, I mean, it has an advantage in some situations in terms of your ability to survive and reproduce, but it's not a moral thing per se. Yeah, I mean, the other the other aspect of that is like particularly when it comes to notions of social evolution. I'm making huge air quotes here. The idea that biology, and we'll get into this more. The idea that for one, biology is the only structure that matters, and for two, that there are no pressures within so, uh, within societies or within people interacting with the environment that would lead to changes in behavior alone as opposed to changes in genetics is just blatantly wrong. Like you yeah. can have, and I want to be extremely explicit here by what I mean by this, you can have an evolution in social structure and evolution in social behavior, which is not biologically driven and is not any kind of like superiority bullshit but is simply a behavioral response to an environment or a behavioral response to interactions between different things. Yeah. That can happen, and it does not have to be tied up with the ideology around race superiority or whatever the fuck. Well, also you see, like, um, like for example, why would it make sense that the evolution from feudalism to capitalism why would it make sense that necessarily the traders and lawyers would be the people who most benefited from that movement, like, necessarily? It kind of just evolved amongst a set of contradictions and, like, social factors. Like, Yeah, there, there is no intention here. Yeah. We like to think that humans are intentional in their long-term behavior. I'm sorry, that's kind of bullshit, to be perfectly yeah. honest. There may be some ability to int intend stuff. But on the whole, everyone's just kind of muddling through. Absolutely. Let's have a look at Galton's academic work. I'm only going to talk about some of the stuff that each of these people have done because there's a lot and not all of it is something that I can deal with in this sort of time. Some of the things that he worked on are questionnaires as a scientific tool, which has become one of the central ways that sociology collects data, for example. So this was basically you go and you ask somebody about themselves, about their family, about their environment, and you use that as your evidence. He also uh, was involved in the like invention, I suppose, of statistics like the mean and the variance, or standard deviation. What he was doing with these was using the mean to represent a central tendency, and the devi standard deviation or variance to represent the literal deviation of actual observations from that central tendency. Go back and listen to our episode about summary statistics if you want a bit more investigation of that. But these are population level statistics that you use to describe populations as a kind of a summary. They look at the relationship between individual observations and the population as a whole, but they are not necessarily representative at an individual level. He also worked on uh, what's known as the bell curve. Oh, I know this one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, so it's, it's, it's a distribution, as in like a mathematical object, which is also called the normal distribution. Uh, it also shows up in um, some quite odious parts of like race, uh, race realism, like that kind of thing, and like IQ testing and whatever else. I'm, we will do an episode sometime on the statistical structure of IQ because it's fascinating and horrifying at the same time. In his case, Galton was looking at this as the general shape of measurements around their mean. So it kind of came from experimental evidence. Yeah. So he was basically saying that, in general, you have your mean and you will have a population for the sorts of measurements that he looked, he was looking at, that looks lo roughly like this, where you can measure the distance between a point and the mean, 
and this is your deviation. It should be pointed out how many structures are like beaten into that shape as well in terms of oh, like yeah. our education system and things like that. Like Yeah, so like one of the things that comes up in this, and I wasn't really going to talk about it, but what the hell, is the dedication to this being the fundamental shape of populations. So the next guy we're, we're going to talk about was so sure that within any population, any measurement that you make should look like this, that he actually considered like – a population that didn't look like this to be evidence that you were in fact measuring two races at the same time, and then you should go looking for what those races are. I'm not even joking. I wish I was. Exciting. Yeah. Galton also looked at correlation, which is a general term for measuring how two variables change together. We've talked about straight line correlation before in episode 23. Uh, that's another guy who we'll get to. But the general idea here is that you have two different things that you are measuring, and they have some sort of relationship where as one increases, the other tends to increase, or vice versa, as one increases, the other tends to decrease. So you can look at height and weight as just one sort of an example, but there's so many of these, and they can take different sort of statistical measurement forms, but overall, correlation is a way of quantifying that relationship. Galton was also quite enthusiastic about quantifying mental ability. <laughs> I know. Uh, he didn't necessarily have a way to like measure intelligence the way we currently think of IQ. Like This was during the 1800s and things, late 1800s. So that sort of construction hadn't been invented yet, but certainly his ideas about intelligence carry through to works like The Bell Curve, which if you haven't heard of it, is this incredibly racist book arguing that non-white people are just less intelligent than white people on the whole. Well, do you know what uh, Charles Murray was doing before he wrote that book? Oh, go on. During the Vietnam War, he went to Thailand to work on quasi-sociological experiments about like how you can use rational choice theory to stop certain populations from rebelling against imperialism oh, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Part of Galton's idea of like mental ability here was things that, like reaction time or sensory perception. So that's the sort of thing that he was really enthusiastic about measuring because he didn't have a great idea of what like intelligence really looked like other than his ideas around himself being a genius and what that meant. Our next odious individual is Carl Pearson, who was a keen follower of Galton and took up the first chair of eugenics at University College London, which Galton's deceased estate actually paid for. All of these people had something to do with University College London. Galton studied there, it's what he dropped out of. Carl Pearson studied there, as, as well as the next guy we're going to come to, and this chair of eugenics at that institution was kind of, the, I guess, the, the highest position an academic could really take in the eugenics movement for a while. Pearson was big into race war, very literally. He considered war between races a necessary mechanism for killing off weak people within each population, as well as showing the triumph of the superior, quote-unquote, race over the other one. He was a huge fan of colonial genocide and an explicit advocate of it in the US. Despite claiming to be a socialist, he did not extend that theory to what he called the degenerate and feeble stock within a race, which he considered too biologically limited to be worth the effort of things like good education, healthcare, and social support, because clearly their kids would also be degenerate and feeble stock, as he called them. Find me a 19th century socialist and then look, <laughs> look, at, what they, look at what they said about either India or Ireland. It's... <laughs> Down to a man. Well, I mean, you take the Irish or the Indian socialists for that. <laughs> Pearson was also a rampant and explicit anti-Semite, particularly when it came to Jewish migration to Britain. He died in 1935, but we can guess what he would have thought about the Holocaust. Overall, a deeply repugnant creature. He did come up with many of the foundations of mathematical statistics, however, and a lot of things that we use today are based on his work. Here is a non-exhaustive list. The chi-squared test for independence, which we discussed in episode 23? Yes. It is a way of testing for evidence that a relationship exists between two different things that you're measuring. 
This is a theme in Pearson's work. He was looking for association between things, usually race and something else. Uh, so race and intelligence, race and like vitality, whatever you wanted to, or hereditary patterns in general. Pearson's correlation coefficient, which is a measure of the strength and direction of a straight line relationship. Uh, we discussed that in episode 23 as well. But basically this is saying if you have stuff that does like... So you have your variables like this, and there's a relationship where they tend to do that. This is a stronger relationship than if you've got something spaced out like this on the same sort of scale. Yeah. So it's a way of measuring that, basically. He is also credited with the use of the first histogram, which is a visual representation of data that shows where it is clustered. So you have some sort of numerical measurement, uh, you split your data up into intervals, and you count how many observations are in, in each interval. So you wind up with something that looks like this. So let's say we have, these are our sort of buckets here. Uh, I'm numbering those for basically convenience to show you that there is ordering and a measurement relationship. And then you say I've got like this many between one and two, this many between two and three, this many between three and four, and this many between four and five. The height of each bar represents how many observations are in that interval. So you use this to get a an idea of the shape and the common uncommon values. So you can see that this is mostly clustered around like here, somewhere between three and four. You don't have any observations less than one. You don't have any observations greater than five. And stuff between one and two, for example, is less common than stuff between three and four. So that's the sort of stuff you could talk about with a histogram. Pearson also uh, developed one of the early conceptions of p-values. Uh, we're not going to discuss the technical detail of that. If you want to know more about p-values, episodes 12 and 13 are a quite extensive introduction to them, as well as their use in hypothesis testing. And this theory of hypothesis testing was in part developed by Pearson. He was looking for evidence of relationship between variables, so he was interested in hypotheses around there is or is not a relationship between things, which is slightly different to what we'll see in the next guy. For example, with your test for independence, you get a p-value which you can use to say whether you have enough evidence to claim that there is a relationship between the variables that you're looking at. Our last dickhead is Ronald Fisher who had quite famous beef with Pearson because Fisher saw eugenics as a scientific framework and was actually opposed to what he saw as its political use by Pearson and similar in race stuff. This is one of those cases where a nerd is completely unable to see the impact of their science on the world as actually political. Fisher was extremely assertive about the existence of race as a measurable structure of populations, and much of his statistical work was driven by an effort to find this structure and to show the difference between the populations. But, he was not an explicit race supremacist in the manner of Pearson. So he was like, these populations are different, they shouldn't intermix, and particularly they shouldn't breed together, but they should be treated more or less the same. He wrote a letter in 1954 uh, that was opposed to what he called, quote, propaganda in favour of miscegnation, I think that's how it's pronounced, which is miscegnation. Miscegenation, right? It, uh, which miscegenation. Is miscegenation. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One day. <laughs> uh, so this is mixed-race marriages in North America, but that letter did also propose that it should be possible to, quote, give and justly administer equal rights to all citizens without fooling ourselves that, uh, I've correct changed the term wording here slightly, the races are equivalent items. So... Black and white people are irreconcilably different species, but we should still treat them similarly, according to Fisher. One would say separate but equal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. His eugenics did have an explicit class element. He saw declining fertility among the upper classes as literally the cause of the fall of civilization, <laughs> and was very worried about this among the British upper classes at the time. He wrote books about the fall of civilizations like the Romans, and claimed that it was because the upper classes stopped producing as many kids. Handshake meme, Ronald Fisher, Shinzo Abe. <laughs> Poor people, according to Fisher, should not be given material support to have large families because this would encourage the outbreeding of the clearly superior upper classes. Fisher was also involved in efforts to legislate the forced sterilization of, quote, feeble-minded high-grade defectives in Britain, which he considered to be up to a tenth of the population as judged by measures of mental ability. 
Fisher's work on this was readily adopted by eugenicists in the US, who went on to forcibly sterilize a lot of people for a long time. You can see this in forced sterilization uh, policies in places like Kentucky and more broadly in the US, where they basically said that anybody who fell into certain criteria for being what we would call, now call mentally disabled would be forcibly sterilized because they uh, were a threat to the well-being of the general population should they have kids. You can uh, also say it in the film Idiocracy by Mike yeah. Judge. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, like, I'm almost tempted to do like a watch episode of that film. I have never seen it, but I imagine it will make me extremely angry. It's like extremely right wing. It's kind of actually funny as a movie. Mm. In retrospect, <laughs> well, clearly in retrospect, we should go maybe and watch not, it. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's possible to find it funny in how ridiculous it is without necessarily finding it like funny as in the jokes land. That's the thing, though. At least when I saw it, some of the jokes do land, but it's oh, just a repugnant in its ideology. Yeah, it's like... yeah. Furthermore, after World War Two, Fisher continued to collaborate with Nazis and wrote in explicit support of a German eugenicist who had worked with the Nazis then wound up at Adelaide University. Fischer said that the Nazis had, on the whole, quote, sincerely wished to benefit the German racial stock, especially by the elimination of manifest defectives, quote, unquote, which he means like the systematic murder of people with disabilities. Yeah. So according to Fischer, Nazi race science was misguided and political. Nazi extermination of people with disabilities was a good and completely unpolitical thing to do. The ableism in eugenics is just so kind of fundamental and so rife that it really does like underpin the whole thing. And I feel it gets lost a little bit in discussions of the racism that shows up in a lot of eugenics, because realistically, these ideas still apply today. Like, we'll talk more about the sort of um, legacy of this stuff, but any time you see somebody saying that there should be, like, a test that you have to do to become a parent, that leads to all of this stuff. Yeah. Because, like, what it means to be a good parent is taken to be in isolation that you can take care of your child to the standards of, shall we say, uh, middle-class proficiency. The material conditions in which people do this never taken into account, to be perfectly honest, and what it actually means to have a good life to these sorts of people inevitably looks like you live without disability. And, yeah, that, that kind of sucks. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I can't imagine it's super kind on people uh, uh, like already marginalized people like sex workers, for example. Oh, no. So th there are a lot of um, works in eugenics, but also like works in social theory, which basically posit that uh, people who wind up in those sorts of work in that sort of work are somehow, well, biologically degenerate is the usual way it's framed. So they are inclined to wind up in those circumstances because there is something fundamentally wrong with them. And, like, whether they choose to go into sex work because they have no other alternative or whatever, or just because they, like, enjoy it, which is perfectly legitimate, that is seen as something that is morally and, like, populationally damaging. So you get a lot of people, like, caught up in these eugenics frameworks that supposedly measure how good a population is, that, like, it's just... It's just material conditions. Uh, I, I title, I'm going to title this episode What No Material Analysis Does to a Motherfucker because every time you see this sort of research, if you scratch it even a little bit to look at the relationship between whatever they are proposing and like whether or not somebody has access to regular food, turns out access to regular food or whatever other material conditions you want to look at is a far better predictor than what they are proposing. Well, you say that they're... That there's no material, like they don't have material analysis. I think they're deliberately doing that. <laughs> I think oh, yeah, yeah. We will talk about this. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> Fisher's most famous academic work was actually bringing together theories of evolution from Darwin and the genetics and heritability of traits from the work of a Czech botanist called Johann Mendel. The melding of these two, along with the rigorous statistical methods for how these come to manifest across the population, 
legitimately became the foundations of a lot of contemporary population genetics. This is one of those things where, like, all of these people have developed things that we still use, and, we, and like, a lot of this stuff we still use quite directly, but they were doing it, and a lot of time, for really fucked up reasons. Absolutely. Fisher also did a lot of work on ways to measure the differences between populations. So one of the ways he dealt with is called ANOVA, which anybody who has looked at social science, particularly psychology, is probably familiar. This is called analysis of variance. So ANOVA, we'll talk about this more at some point, looks to see how much of the variation in a bunch of observations can be attributed to the differences between groups rather than the differences within them. My favorite diagram to draw for this sort of thing is imagine you've got like your groups A and B, you have some measure on this axis, A winds up with a bunch of observations over here, B winds up with a bunch of observations over here, then you can say, okay, well the mean of the population for A is roughly there, the mean of the population for B is roughly there. So we're going to say that the difference between these two is a between population difference uh, or variation whereas if you look at the variation within one of these groups it is a within population variance so ANOVA is a way of looking at how much variation there is between groups as opposed to within groups and like apportioning the variation of the total data set where you kind of combine everything to each of those like sources. You can do this with multiple groups. I've shown it with just two here, but you can have as many as you like. You just arguably uh, need increasing amounts of data to deal with that. As part of this, Fisher worked on significance testing for hypotheses, which is where you determine a threshold at which two groups of observations are different enough to be evidence that the underlying populations are in fact fundamentally different. In ANOVA, you apply this to multiple groups. You can have, like, as I said, however many you want, and your fundamental test in ANOVA is that at least two of them are different, and then you can go and look at the individual populations as pairs and say which of these are different. There are other tests that he worked on. So for two populations, there's one called a t-test for the difference of means. We won't go into what that does, but you can think of it as a way of testing whether you have two populations with different means for whatever you're measuring, as opposed to, like, there is no difference is your null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. These three also had a bunch of other more technical stuff. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, I don't necessarily know enough about it, and it's too hard to talk about in this sort of a format. Go to a stats degree if you're really enthusiastic. What I have mentioned here is the core of what I want to talk about in the relationship between the work of these guys and their ideology. So it's time to get thematic. Across all three of these people, there is a determination that the state of social structures, class and race particularly, are both scientifically real and need defending in order to protect the population. Galton was looking for things to measure to describe the different populations. Pearson was looking at associations between members of a group and some other membership of a group and some other variable. Fisher was looking at ways to quantify evidence of differences between populations. They did not construct methods that deal with how similar populations are. Like, the fundamental framework we have for hypothesis testing, where you have something like your null hypothesis is that your two populations are the same, and your alternative is that two populations are different. However, this gets framed with regard to the specific variable in question. This is not treating similarity as intellectually equivalent to difference. The null hypothesis is a straw man argument to be torn down by the weight of evidence. If you have enough evidence to reject null hypothesis, this is considered strong support for the alternative. But if you don't, that's not really saying that the null hypothesis is true in the same way, or the better explanation of the evidence. It's saying that we don't have enough evidence to say that the null hypothesis is clearly false. Yeah. That might be because the null hypothesis is true, but could also be because we don't have the right evidence. Our data wasn't good enough, we didn't have a big enough sample size, or missed some confounding factor, whatever. The baseline assumption isn't that a failure to reject the null hypothesis means there's more evidence for it, but rather that the evidence is hiding somewhere just out of reach of what you've actually got. 
This has become quite pathological in academic publishing, where papers without statistically significant results, ones which don't reject a null hypothesis, will just not get published. That's slowly changing, uh, but you should go listen to our episodes on p-values for more on that sort of thing. These frameworks for testing also say absolutely nothing about the explanation for any differences that appear, or structures that appear. They say this exists, or this does not exist, but not why. If you have decided that it's a matter of biology, you're not interested in questioning that with an alternative theory, which is where the material conditions come into play, right? Absolutely. Galton, the TOF, was entirely disinterested in looking for other explanations. The interesting conflict here is between Fisher and Pearson. Pearson's Marxist theory let him see that there were material conditions at play within the distribution of a race, but he was manifestly unable to expand that analysis to the impacts of things like empire and like extraction of resources and slavery and all that sort of thing between races. That's just a result of his racism. He saw differences between races as biologically inherent and differences within a race as, well, maybe they're feeble-minded or whatever he wanted to phrase it, but otherwise, well, they just don't have the material conditions to really support their full white person potential. Yeah. Fisher saw poor people as biologically inferior and was more in favour of genetics as an explainer of class structure than race theory. Though he did see race as a measurable biological property, just not one that was related to hierarchy necessarily. This stuff still pops up today. So there's a pretty infamous uh, research thing called the marshmallow test. This came out of like psychology. Basically, they found that if you put a kid in a room alone with a marshmallow and tell the kid that if they don't eat it before you come back, they'll get a second marshmallow, some kids are more likely to wait for the second marshmallow than others. And the patient kids tend to go on to be more successful in schools, uni, their careers, whatever. The researchers for this originally proposed that they were measuring some fundamental ability to like conceptualize and anticipate a greater future reward. However, on reanalysis of the data and other experiments, it was determined that if you control for material conditions in the form of class, particularly food precarity at home, this future reward perception, whatever, goes away. Yeah. It turns out you're better off using whether a kid trusts that there will be more food available in 10 minutes than their ability to conceptualize a second marshmallow. This kind of biological essentialism has been inherited by both the ongoing, largely discredited eugenics movement, largely, and fields like evolutionary psychology. Evo Psych has no idea how genetics and evolution works, but that doesn't stop them invoking it, of course. <laughs> this comes back to our idea of there are social structures that affect both people's behavior and their physiology as a result of material conditions. That's not countenanced by Evo Psych people, because it immediately brings a moral imperative to dismantle those hierarchies and inequalities. And, like, that would make Jordan Peterson sad. Well, the thing about Evo Psych as well is even in the non particularly like uh, Jordan Peterson cases of it, it fails. A lot of it, I remember coming out being about gender, right? Oh, God. It, it fails <laughs> so, to, like, conceptualize that gender is different in different cultures and yep. goes with the Western explanation every single time. <laughs> like, it's very, uh -huh, like... Uh -huh. Isn't uh, it funny? Yeah. So, I have a um, well, I have a bit of a story about Evo Psych. So, in the first year of my maths degree, I decided to do a psychology elective, just basically out of interest, and I figured, for me, it would be relatively easy because I'd already done an arts degree, and it was. In one lecture, which... Um, was was talking about like different fields of psychology and things and talking about things like gender difference. The lecturer mentioned a, a, an Evo Psych study. Uh, he didn't mention it as Evo Psych, but he'd bring it up, in which conventionally attractive young research assistants of the male, uh, shall we say, male and female persuasion, went out into a university campus and propositioned members of the uh, the alternate of an alternate gender. So. Your um, woman would go up to a man and proposition him, and man would go up to women and proposition them. And they had three sorts of levels of proposition. Would you like to go out to dinner? Would you like to come home with me? And would you like to sleep with me? Now, they found that on the whole, the uh, male people who got asked this were quite gung-ho for all of those options. The female people who got asked this, very much more hesitant. 
This was taken by the original researchers to be evidence of the fact that men are more biologically inclined to promiscuity than women. The fact that they never once considered that maybe there's a safety concern for a woman being like, hey, here's a stranger I don't know, walking up and saying, will you fuck me? Or will you go home with me? That just never occurred to them, or at least they didn't want to consider it. And the real problem I had with this being introduced in the psychology subject was that it was the only criticism that this lecturer had of the, su- of the study was, oh, you probably wouldn't get ethics approval for that these days. <laughs> that was all th- oh my god, it was so bad. That was his only <laughs> comment on it. Well, also, it seems like, I don't know, it seems like, I don't know if like wanting like an hour of conversation before sleeping some- with someone rather than just immediately taking the proposition is evidence that one is more promiscuous than the other. (laughs) So the the evidence for that particular thing was that women were, on the whole, less likely to respond positively to any of them, but they were particularly did not respond positively to the, the more adventurous ones, let's say. So they might say yes to a date, but not a single one said yes to, hey, will you fuck me? Yeah. It lacks introspection, let me put it that way. (laughs) So all of these problems are doubly true for the treatment of people with disabilities, or even just those with natural variation, which covers most disabilities as far as I'm concerned, in whatever you're trying to measure as ability. Fisher's bottom 10% of the population, for example. If you are get rid of the bottom 10%, aside from the horror of doing that, what you get out of it is a new population with a different bottom 10%, which you can still measure on the same scales and which will still have like that 10% who don't perform as well as anybody else. So this is a cycle without restriction. If you decide that you want to do the eugenics thing and forcibly sterilize the bottom 10% of your population, assuming you can build a metric for that, which is valid, which I don't think exists, you wind up with more and more of what would have been your originally uh, original population gets classified as limited in ability. That idea that you can do this repeatedly over generations is just fucked. Like, like most fascist ideas, it winds up being a death cult, basically. There is, of course, the fundamental disregard for the lives and value of people with disabilities. This was a core principle in eugenics. Like, they claim to be all for ensuring the well-being of the human population, blah, 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 which basically meant that they didn't consider people with disabilities to be human on some level, and thus eradicating them from the population is justifiable. Even today, you can see this sort of logic at play. Well, as I said, any time you see somebody saying, oh, there should be a test for having kids, that's that kind of logic, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's also other things like people who are judged to be, well, unable to take care of themselves can be forcibly uh, put on contraceptives. Like Britney Spears, as a like pretty famous case, was not able to um, have a contraceptive device removed under her own desire because uh, I, can't, I think her father was granted control over her medical decisions. So her father had her implanted with a contraceptive device, possibly against her will initially, I don't know, but certainly against her will later on, and she wasn't allowed to get it taken out because she was classified as having limited ability to make her own decisions. Well, yeah, and you see this all the time as well with things like overpopulation fears. Yeah. Um, God save the new king, I guess. He (laughs) fucking participated in that shit, so... Yeah, isn't it funny how his environmentalism gets framed as this kind of, like, heroic effort when he was very quick to say, oh, no, I won't be doing that, now I'm king. But also, like, a lot of it was related to this sort of stuff. Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, when they were still together as well, like... A yeah. bunch of rich people love this shit. It's uh, and they're causing much more environmental destruction yeah, isn't it funny? than the families that they're talking about. Like the only overpopulation problem we have is the population of billionaires, and that can be remedied without anybody dying. So even in like government systems which seek to like pr- supposedly provide welfare support for like people with disabilities, they quantify disability. In a, in, they have to do that. We, I have a little episode that I'm going to write at some point, I promise, about the quantification of disability in the Australian welfare system. The methods used to do this are very similar 
to those uh, which were developed to identify people unfit to breed by eugenicists. I also think it's extremely telling that the disability care sector here in Australia and the disability welfare sector, they are built around quantifying how much or how little labour can be extracted from somebody rather than just giving them the help that they need to lead fulfilling lives. Because that would be communism and that would be bad, right? Well, but that's the whole thing, right? Like, that's that's not just a disability. That's our entire like. Yeah, it's all about um, what you can extract being from people as as neoliberal subjects, right? <laughs> like mm. within statistics, we are slowly grappling with this legacy. Uh, number of buildings and like academic positions, they are having the names of these eugenicists taken off them. Like that that chair for eugenics at uh, University College London was originally called the Galton Chair of Eugenics. I don't think it exists anymore because it's a eugenics position. And after World War II, people went, oh, maybe that's not such a great idea to put on things. Buildings named after Fisher and Pearson are being renamed. Uh, prizes named after them as well. Uh, this is like kind of aesthetic in a sense, but I think it's also quite important to have those symbols taken away. I think that it is more important to address the kind of intellectual structure of these like academic things that would that were built on the kind of principles that you get out of these people. Like we are moving beyond the very limited frameworks for null hypothesis significance testing that came out of these people. And that's that's one sort of step and we are now building ways of measuring similarity and things like that which they just completely ignored this history though that these people existed and these weren't the only ones they're just kind of the big three and who work together and in this like university college london whatever else that history needs to be a lot more widely taught and the way that the ideology that went into constructing these statistics influenced the statistics that were constructed needs to be taught because this ridiculous notion that oh you can do science objectively and it's not political and whatever else it's just complete bullshit there is no statistic that has not been constructed in a con- in material conditions by somebody and so many of them have been done for explicitly ideological c- reasons like these here hopefully this episode can change that a little bit all right that's the uh depressing stuff I have a mailbag segment. It's first for a Ooh. while, actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, it's a bad figure. <laughs> they have found something that I hate even more than a pie chart. <laughs> 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 Which is an achievement, let's be honest. This abomination uh, comes from the Washington Post. They created the figure. This is where they got the data from to build it. Basically, this is looking at um, voter distribution, like wh- what segments of the population voted for different things or didn't vote at all. And I believe that there is a party affiliation represented by the color. There, the like lines over this represent who they actually vote for. Among these independents, you can see that there is a section that didn't vote. There's a section who voted for Trump and a section who voted for Biden. The reason this is fucked is that. All you can get is a vague idea of relative size. Like, this section in here, which is the uh, identified Democrats who voted for Trump, is quite small. Like, But I can't meaningfully compare that size to the size of the registered Republicans who voted for Biden, because I just can't stack those figures on top of each other and get, a, get an idea of the area. No, absolutely. Oh, it's a fractal of bad design here. <laughs> also, yeah, on um, both the Democrats and the Republican side, the didn't vote or other, that kind of like... Those could be the same size, but you've got no fucking idea how to actually compare those areas, like, right? Why would, you, why would you take the, in the Trump area, uh, in the Democrat area, why would you have the Trump slice taken not off those figures, but in the Republican area? It is sliced off those figures. It's <laughs> really know. weird. It's so bad. Like... <laughs> I will never say this again, and nobody quote me, okay? But this is a pie chart would be better. It would still be bad, but it would be better, because then at least you could say, like, let's say we have a pie chart here, and this is your wedge, which was the Trump voter, the the registered Republicans. You say, well, that much in here voted for Trump, 
that much in here voted for Biden, and this is they didn't vote, right? That is immediately more comparable to a similar thing. So I'm so I'm going to shade that red. <laughs> so that's the that's the bit for the Republicans. This is the bit for the Democrats. Yeah. And within the Democrats, you have the similar thing, right? You have a very skinny bit who voted for Trump. You had a whole bunch, most of them who voted for Biden. Then you had like didn't. This is so much more comprehensible than this clusterfuck. I can tell you right now, whoever whoever actually produced this had to go to so much more effort to build it like <laughs> this than to do a pie chart or to do literally anything else. So much work went into making it this bad. And, oh, if it wasn't built just to piss me off, it sure fucking feels like it. Ah, uh, see, I think it's, I think it's attempting to kind of like, uh, Maybe, like, sweep away some of the uh, fact that a large proportion of the US voting population just isn't engaged and does not vote. Yeah, well, I do find it interesting that they put the under-18s in here as well. Because I feel like, yeah, why would you do that? <laughs> I can't remember the estimates. Wasn't there, like, 70% of eligible voters actually showed up to the last election? And eligible voters is not nearly as much of the population as you might expect. So the people who actually voted for Trump, as a proportion of the whole population, wound up being about 25%. Biden as well. It's the it's the problem we have to grapple with with uh, modern politics is that uh, the people we need just don't vote. Like, yeah. It's, uh... Well, in Australia, that's less of an issue than in the US. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. we have compulsory voting and... Um, it's a different system. Yeah, so I, I genuinely do believe that the um, what people call ranked choice, we call preferential voting, does actually make a difference there. There are still people who dummy vote, and you can. In, there are statistics about what proportion of the population is dummy voting in Australia, but in general, there is there is more options that feel meaningful here compared to your first past the post or just single vote sort of model. And I think that's really, really important to the idea of democracy, I guess. I, it has its downsides as well in that you don't tend to get, like, radical changes out of it mm. um, in terms of, like, it's very, like... Yeah, well, it's going to be very interesting how that manifests if we get a vote on a republic in the near future. Uh, referendums have their own problems, but um, yeah. at least it's just a yes-no vote. Well, no, it doesn't with. have to be. Because if you could have that set up to be, like, we continue with what we have now with a parliamentary monarchy, we transition to some sort of republic system, or we transition to a different sort of republic system, or however you want to structure that, you could put more options on there than just the two. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, isn't, the, isn't the word coming down that it will be a, a yes-no initially and then you vote on the they'll have another vote to decide the model kind of thing i don't i haven't read anything into it i've, I've been too busy looking at memes about uh liz popping her clogs and laughing <laughs> <laughs> as we all have yeah yeah all right that is an episode but thank you for coming on thank you very much if you have enjoyed this then please go and have a look at our patreon uh fuel my addiction to coffee and bart's use of coffee i don't know if you have the same problem i do but we'll buy bart some beer and buy me some coffee <laughs> i've just uh i've just stopped drinking red bull so if you want oh to my God. <laughs> update my uh coffee addiction <laughs> that would be uh, very handy mm, we'll get you onto something a little more middle class absolutely <laughs> but that is patreon.com slash statistically insignificant you will get access to our full history of bonus episodes as well as future bonus content, and on the rare op occasion that I actually remember to edit an episode before the week it comes out, you'll get access to that early too. Alright, Bart, I will see you next time. See you then.